Hello, everyone. I think we are live now, and I hope um, that you can all hear me properly. My name is Henning Gross Roos Khan. I'm one of the co directors of the Center for Intellectual Property and Information Law at the University of Cambridge. And I have the great pleasure to introduce for our SIPL talk um, today Dr. Daniel Aqua who is at the Turku Institute for Advanced Studies and is also an associate researcher at the Institute for European Studies at the Free University of Brussels. Um, Daniel has been working on intellectual property, international intellectual property, and in particular free trade agreements in the context of international IP law for quite a while. And uh, this particular presentation today is in the broader context of a book project where um, Daniel is submitting this in a revised or extended version perhaps as a chapter to a uh, book which I'm doing together with Axel Metzger, uh, Intellectual Property uh, Beyond Borders. And I think the key aspect or one of the most intriguing aspects for me to ask Daniel to join that project and also to present here was that he's one of the few and perhaps first people to really look at the um, notion of twail third world approaches to international law in the context of intellectual property. So we have had, of course, for quite a while, uh, if not for fair, uh, several decades, debates about access to medicines, human rights and intellectual property and so on. But the sort of broader critical discourse in international law on third world approaches to international law and what that might mean for intellectual property hasn't, I think, to the extent I'm familiar with it, been much looked at. So Daniel, in that sense, really sort of steps into new territory here and has um, kindly agreed to, to discuss that topic with us in the particular context of technical assistance. So I'll just stop here and hand over to Daniel to present and I look forward to his presentations and then hear from, uh, well, maybe some of you with this, uh, questions later on, which you are very welcome to already during the talk, post in the chat. And with that, Daniel, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Henan, for the nice introduction and thanks for inviting me to, to be part of the CIPL uh, webinar series. Let me share my screen. So today I'll be talking to you about technical assistance as a tool for implementing and expanding intellectual property treaty obligations. I'll be mostly focusing on Africa and using as Henning rightly identified uh, the third world approaches to international law doctrine. Uh, this is just an overview of what I hope to do in the next few uh, minutes, uh, introduce you briefly to the third world approaches to international law that is TWIL and how it relates to my research. Um, then I will zoom in straight to the inter intellectual property IP landscape in Africa, just to give you a broader picture of why I'm using TWIL, and then also look at the origins of intellectual property technical assistance. And then finally, I'll look into the WIPO uh, technical assistance to mostly one uh, uh, intellectual property organization that is the African Intellectual Property Organization the Francophone uh, side of Africa. Um, for your information, I've only recently returned from uh, a research stay at the African Regional Intellectual Property Organization. That is the Francophone, Francophone side of, of, of the African uh, 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 IP organizations that I'll be talking about. So we have two intellectual property organizations in Africa for the very reason of, of, of uh, colonialism and the related issues that we probably might also see in, in this presentation. So yes, um, what is TWIL? Well, uh, technical assistance in a way has been criticized uh, as constituting a reproduction of the dominant Western uh, uh, view of intellectual property rights. In that sense, it's been seen as a political project than merely you know, a technical measure or neutral measure that is aimed at helping uh, uh, nations of the global south. And I think that in a way resonates with the broader dialectic of uh, TWIL as a critical perspective to international law. So where do we situate TWIL as a methodology? It, it, premise, uh, it is premised on the fact that the third world is a political reality that unifies much of the world outside 
Western Europe, the United States and Canada. Nations of the third world remain politically and economically subordinate to the powers in these two regions. And this subordination cannot be understood apart from European colonialism and its legacy. So 12 scholars who locate international law in this colonial project and attempt to understand and deconstruct the ways in which this genealogy so defines international law as a system of empire and subordination and some conceptual risk conceptualize international law in, in ways that disrupt hierarchies of power. And if you look at my work as Henning rightly identified, that is what I'm trying to do to, to kind of look into the international framework of intellectual property, also the European framework, and to, to critique it from this dimension that much of, much of what we see is, is a remnant of what has happened in the past. And, and as I'm going to show briefly, uh, it kind of reflects very much in the current IP landscape in Africa. I would say it's a bit complicated, but also fragmented system we have there. So in no particular order, I would like to start with the African Union. So when you go to Africa, we have the African Union that properly speaking, if I may use European parlance, uh, doesn't have competence in matters of intellectual property. So the founding treaty for or convention for the African Union does not mention intellectual property, and neither does the Constitutive Act of the African Union mention intellectual property. In the absence of that, the African Union has come up with some intellectual property instruments. There are five of them, one of them, them being the model law, which I'll probably expand on later on. And then now we have what we call the Af African Free Continental uh, 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 Trade Area, that, that massive international uh, uh, agreement or treaty that has been negotiated among 55 or 54 African countries. Uh, the first part revolved around uh, uh, trading goods and, and services dispute settlement. Now, the second phase of the negotiation is about intellectual property, a protocol on intellectual property, a protocol on investment, and also competition and others. Now, what scholars and commentators are hoping for regarding the intellectual property protocol for AFTA is that it should be able, in a way, to harmonize the intellectual property framework. In Africa, as you, uh, because as you see in the screen, it is quite fragmented. Because when you take the African Union away, you have two different regional intellectual property organizations, one belonging to the Francophone side, the other one belonging to the Anglophone side. The OAP, that is the African Intellectual Property Organization located in Cameroon, is, is the French side and the ARIPO, African Regional Intellectual Property Organization, uh, located in Harare, Zimbabwe, is, is the Anglophone side, the, the organization that I recently uh, 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 visited. These two regional organizations have different frameworks when it comes to intellectual property. So the OAP, the Francophone side, has a uniform framework, meaning that whatever rules or protocols or treaties that are negotiated at the regional level automatically applies or is binding on the member states of OAP whereas the ARIPO system is flexible. So they have this tier system where the member states agree to negotiate on a protocol or a treaty. And after that, each of them decide whether and as to when to ratify that treaty. So then these two regional bodies operate on different uh, dimensions altogether. Then below, we have the regional economic communities, the RECs. There are eight of them. So what you just see is just two of them the Economic Community of West African States and then also the Southern African uh, Development uh, Community. Then below, we have also national laws, especially those of the uh, uh, repo member states. Uh, and then obviously member states that are not party to, to the uh, OAP or repo, for instance, Nigeria, and also South Africa are countries that aren't parties to either of these uh, organizations. So. Then we have member states of the African Union having different uh, IP uh, 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 laws. And, and that kind of makes the whole, I mean, system a bit fragmented and, and, and disjointed. Or there's a sharp disconnect between what one uh, 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 institution is doing compared to what the other is doing. And even when it comes, when we come to the RECs, the regional economic communities, is the same thing. We see 
variations in, 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 in the interest and, and, and focus of, of, of these uh, bodies when it comes to the regulation or standardization of intellectual property. Now, if you look at the lists on the screen, it's, it's from the United Nations, the, the list of least developed countries as of 2021, we have 46 of them. And out of the 46, 33 of these countries are from Africa. Now, 13 each of these countries in Africa belong to OAP and ARIPO. So 13 of the least developed countries we see here are member states of ARIPO, and then 13 are member states of OAP. So technically speaking, that means that uh, these countries are not obliged, they are not under any strict obligations under international law to implement any strict intellectual property norms according to the TRIPS agreement. As you would see in the screen, recently the TRIPS uh, Council agreed for a general extension of, of the transitional arrangement for, for least developing countries. And if 33 of them are actually from the African continent, then um, there is no case or reason as to why, you know, we should have some, some systems of rules relating to intellectual property in place in the continent. But unfortunately, as I would argue, it seems it is the complete opposite. So I try to borrow from, from uh, 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 Hong Zui's uh, uh, concept of what direction is the wind blowing when he was writing in, in the framework of uh, the Chinese uh, uh, DRM uh, protection. Uh, in this paper, he says that anyone with a basic knowledge about uh, the international IP framework would understand that the west wind is blowing and is blowing across the globe uh, to all nations. And, Specifically, meaning that the Western nations, the powerful nation, economically powerful nation, are pushing a global agenda for the globalization of intellectual property norms, uh, so that all nations should have in place uh, adequate systems of intellectual property. And and that is not far different when it comes to when you look at the case of Africa. Um, I just indicated a quote from from Hong Zui, who says that under the power of the West Wind, the developing countries are educated to believe that the West is the way by default and that they should not only proceed along its prescribed path, but should even go further than the West. And when you look at the context of uh, Africa in terms of uh, IP development or standardization, that is exactly what we see. Whereas many of them are least developed and should have probably utilized the flexibilities inherent in the international IP framework. What we rather see is these countries going ahead to have systems of rules in place that sometimes are what we refer to as TRIPS plus. I mean, they go beyond even what the international system prescribes. And I hope that in the, in the next few slides, I can probably show some few examples, hopefully. Um, in the European uh, African Union uh, and also African broadly, there is this, uh, uh, rhetoric or, 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 or understanding that um, we live, and that is probably so, we now live in, an, in a knowledge economy, we live in an information society age, and, and everything is about technology and intellectual property, and to be able to compete on the global market, we need to develop our innovation base, we need to, you know, be able to produce uh, uh, something that, that, is, that benefits or uh, contributes to the knowledge economy in a way to, to be able to also uh, uh, show up on the global market. But then um, it is, it's, it's a bit tricky when we start thinking that way, because having visited Aripo, for instance, that was the kind of uh, 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 language that I kept hearing that we, we need to rise up, we need to work, we need to compete with the rest in order to, to be able to you know, uh, gain some comparative advantage in, in, in getting uh, out there to the global market. But, it seems to me, for instance, the African Union has this uh, science and technology and innovation uh, policy uh, that spans uh, 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 this period of time. And, and that strategy actually acknowledges that the lack of technology readiness of the continent is something that stands in the gap of Africa when, when it comes to uh, 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 reaching the world market or even competing with the West because Obviously, when it comes to innovation, questions about creativity and technological advancement, you know, there's a wide gap between the, the West advanced countries and, and some of the African countries. And, and 
when you look at the, the, the literature, the scholarship, it tells you that the history of the development of the advanced and industrialized nations initially wasn't the way African countries are trying to make it seem like to, to that if you have strict intellectual property norms in place, then there's a chance that your innovation and creativity industrial system it has a boost. You know, people are encouraged, are incentivized, and therefore they do create and innovate. And invariably, you have products out there in the market which will favorably compete on the global market. And then you have some returns in investment, and people start doing well, and everything becomes good. I think we know for sure that even the advanced nations at the early stages in their development, specifically technological development, uh, imitated. They, 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 they did they permitted re reverse engineering and imitation of copying in a way when they realized that they had come of age, when they realized that they had advanced or developed technologically. Only then did they start you know, protecting intellectual property in the strict sense. So, in a way, I should think African countries could have learned from that, but unfortunately, it seems that is not the case. Now, um, in this paper, which was a contribution to Hanin's uh, book, as he rightly said, I make a claim, and the claim is that technical assistance should be seen as a vector of ideas and practices that progressively led to the systemic integration of African countries into the international IP system. That is what I note as a adherence overdrive. And the curious case of countries inadvertently uh, neglecting the flexibilities inherent in the international IP system when formulating national IP laws and policy, what I claim to be a compliance overdrive, overdrive. So many countries are just adhering to international treaties and also complying, even going beyond the minimum requirements as, as, as stipulated. Now, let me just track a bit of the origins of intellectual property technical assistance. At the foundations of the classical international IP treaties, that is the Paris Convention and the Venn Convention, intellectual uh, technical assistance was backstage. It was not something that was so much pronounced. As a matter of fact, if you look at the funding treaties, I mean, uh, the Ban Convention and, and also the Paris Convention, there were provisions that permitted the European nations to impose their intellectual property laws on their colonies. Obviously, the, the European nations who, who uh, 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 initiated these international uh, conventions of framework were mostly from Europe, and, and they managed to insert provisions that would say that the, 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 the colonies were not members of these uh, conventions or that, but they were nations or countries of the union, meaning that now the colony could impose its uh, 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 national domestic IP laws on the colony by extension. And that was it. There wasn't much regarding technical assistance then. But then the situation changed in the decolonization period, that is in the 1950s, 1960s, when, for instance, many African countries started getting independent. Uh, 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 then these countries now had to, because they originally were members, for instance, of the Paris Convention or the Ben Convention, they needed to make a decision whether to join these international conventions or to leave them. And, and, and there is a general consensus that it was at this point that uh, 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 the development paradigm was in a way introduced into, into the global uh, 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 you know, international framework, specifically the, the technical assistance. Uh, there are two uh, uh, developments regarding this, one from the United Nations and the other one from the uh, US President Harry Truman. Uh, Barely three years into its formation, the, the United Nations came up with uh, two uh, 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 efforts or, or, or strategies to make sure that nations which were had just rightly gotten their independence or attained independence would be helped in a way to, 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 to you know, boost their economy and, and, and also their uh, 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 governance to, to, to in a way, be at par with, with no, if not at par, but at least to, to raise them from poverty in a way that there will be some, some measure of governance going on. Because uh, what colonization did, well, as I will rightly say uh, in, in the next uh, 
uh, slides to come was to, in a way uh, 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 not develop these nations, be it in terms of uh, expertise in governance or even expertise in when it comes to intellectual property matters. That wasn't the case. It was a different uh, uh, scenario altogether. So then in the aftermath of independence, the United Nations thought that, well, the way we can help these, these countries, newly independent countries, is to, is, to, is to provide some measure of technical assistance in a way that will help them to develop technologically and also economically and also when it comes to governance. So then there was the creation of the Economic uh, uh, and Social Council, that the ECOSOC, uh, with the intention of spearheading this project. And also there was a massive call for fundraising to support the Secretary General of the United Nations in fulfilling this, this, this project of uh, sending out missions there to help these newly independent nations. Uh, simultaneously, uh, the, the, in 1969, you know, the uh, United States elected uh, Harry Truman as president, and in his inaugural speech, he, he introduced the, uh, 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 the for what they call the point uh, four uh, program, uh, which meant that he that it was a specific call to international partners to come together and raise funds and to reach out to. The, again, the newly independent nations, because the idea was that, well, if they're so poor, if, if, if they, if not, you know, they're not well developed, if, if, if we have to find a way of integrating them into the world economy, we have to find a way of integrating these nations into, in, you know, into the civilized nations. And, and the way to do that is to offer them some help when it comes to, again, public administration or governance, and also when it comes to technology transfer. So these two uh, developments, in a way, help push the agenda for technical assistance to many African countries. As the then uh, UN Secretary General will rightly put it, he said, the self-determination of peoples is closely linked to the process of economic development uh, to the extent that the United Nations could provide technical assistance to support the latter, it would also advance the former. Well, when it comes to efficiency in public administration and technology transfer, these were things that the, the, the advanced nations then, or the, the nations of the world who were stabilized in a way, felt were ways that they could you know, promote the economic and social development of countries in the global south, making sure that they have some efficient system of uh, uh, administration in place, and also to have uh, the this whole idea of technology transfer happening so that these countries can be able in a way to, 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 to transform their economies by, by you know, learning from, from the, the, the West in when it comes to technological development. So technical assistance in that regard was packaged as a tool for development for the global South. And it was to focus on efficiency in public administration and also technology transfer to boost the innovation framework uh, of these countries. Yet the argument has been for the international IP framework specifically, good governance or efficiency in administration embodied the international minimum standards that has been perpetuated as a benchmark for all to adhere to. And using narratives of development and good governance as a basis to deploy technical assistance amounted to framing uh, political relations as are political in the sense that, uh, as I rightly pointed out earlier, technical assistance seen in the context of twelve scholarship is not just a neutral measure or a technical measure. It is more of a political measure to make sure that these countries continuously relied on, on, on the West. And to do that, we we'll use the concept of development and, and you know, good governance to make sure these countries uh, uh, get along with us. Now, let me talk briefly about the WIPO and the development of IP law in, in Africa in that regard. Uh, most of these countries obviously emerge with weak institutions, fragile economies, because they didn't have training expertise regarding intellectual property, neither in public administration. So when they, obtain or attain their independence, there was a wide gap. And as I said, the United Nations and WIPO had to step in 
when it comes to administration and also intellectual property to make sure these countries are helped initially to, 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 to on their feet in a way to, to integrate into the global economy and also the uh, community of nations. And, and uh, the, the International Bureau for the Protection of Intellectual Property, uh, the predecessor of WIPO, actually started the process of technical assistance in the, in the field of intellectual property. For instance, it drafted a model law for developing countries on inventions in 1965. It also drafted a model law on industrial designs. And, and obviously when WIPO took over, technical assistance was one of the functions envisaged in the convention for uh, WIPO. Now, all these had to do with the kind of liberal progressive talk about development and good governance at, at the time. Anthony Angu, whose photo you see in the screens has said that development just like good governance has universal appeal, all peoples, all everyone, anywhere, the moment they hear about good governance or development are happy to, to, to learn about it, are happy to, to, to receive and to take it up. And in a way, framing a, 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 a technical assistance in, 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 the, in the language of development and good governance got many African countries uh, uh, buying the idea. So actually many uh, 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 accepted or received the kind of technical assistance that was on offer from the United Nations and especially as a specialized agency of the United Nations, the World Intellectual Property Organization. But what should be noted, however, is that economic development was so difficult for countries or difficult in countries that lacked an independent administrative tradition or local expertise in the Western construct of intellectual property and its protection, as I rightly put up early on. Now, if we would focus a bit on, on the development in Francophone Africa and the African Intellectual Property Organization, it, at how it was formed and, and the kind of uh, uh, instruments, IP instruments they have, we'll see more of how WIPO's uh, uh, influence shaped the development of intellectual property law on the continent of Africa. So obviously most of these countries were former colonies of France. And so the Intellectual Property Institute of France and obviously the World Intellectual Property Organization initially came together and designed a framework to help most of the Francophone African countries to come up with uh, the institution, UMP, uh, initially with Madagascar being part of the, that organization. It was uh, done at this uh, 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 Libreville. So it is called the Libreville Agreement. And, and the agreement initially protected patent, trademark, and industrial designs. It also introduced threefold criteria for cooperation. And this threefold criteria for cooperation is actually operational up to date. So there has been amendments to, to the treaties or the uh, founding uh, treaty or conventions for, for, for the, the OIP region. But regardless, these criteria remain. And the first was the, the adoption of a uniform system of industrial property rights protection based on uniform legislation as I rightly identified from the beginning of my presentation. So in the ORP region, uh, there's these uniform, sy uniform systems of law. So uh, any protocol or intellectual property uh, norm that is agreed at the regional level is so automatically applicable to all the member states of, of ORP. The second was the creation of a common authority to serve as the office for the protection of industrial property for each of the member states and the application of common and centralized procedures such that, such that sorry, uh, a single title issued by OAP would be valid in all of the member states. And that is still the case that if you apply for patent or trademark or copyright or whatever you, what have you, uh, once you are given, you are granted your patent, then that title is applicable in all of the member states. And that is far different from the ARIPO, the, uh, the African Regional Intellectual Property Framework, where you, know, you need to go from member state to member state to make sure uh, uh, you get uh, approval. Um, in 1997, uh, the Libreville Agreement was uh, amended in a way to form this new uh, agreement, the Bangui Agreement. Uh, and as I rightly pointed out earlier, 
the same uh, criteria remains. So with the Bangui agreement, there is no need for domestic legal instrument. Uh, no domestic legal instrument is required to enact the Bangui agreement as national legislation. It automatically falls in place that once uh, you have joined this uh, 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 convention or uh, international union, the protocol, the IP protocols that are negotiated at that level uh, applies at the national level as well. The only exception is in the area of copyright where there is some leeway for member states to, to come up with some independent uh, uh, rules regarding uh, aspects of copyright and related rights. Now, in 1999, the Bangui Agreement was again amended and this amendment has remained to date. And this amendment actually led to 10 annexes to, to the agreement. So the first annex was on patent and, and the last was on plant variety regime. Now, scholars and commentators and even critics have said that the man whose picture you see on the screen, Dennis Ekani, who, was, uh, who is a Cameroonian national and who was the uh, uh, director general for OAP for 19 years, actually pioneered the, the, the process of, of amendment or the revision of the Bangui uh, Agreement of 1997. So then you begin to understand why we have probably some of the issues that I'm going to raise subsequently. Uh, you know, more often the argument has been that people like Dennis, uh, Mr. Dennis Ekani, who, you know, has been leading an, uh, an African regional organization or like OAP for, for, for 19 years, who has been logging homes with uh, officials at the World Intellectual Property Organization, the USPTO, and European uh, Intellectual Property Office and elsewhere tend to uh, socialize or be socialized more into the Western concept and framework and understanding of intellectual property as per se, uh, uh, or compared to you know, uh, thinking more about how intellectual property in the context of Africa should be designed and developed. So then they, they tend to develop laws and rules that are in consonance with the Western models and concepts and understanding of how, for instance, a patent law or rule should be compared to what is useful or what will be proper or adequate for a continent like Africa. So these are some of the criticism that has been leveled and it reflects in the patent rule, the utility models, trademark, service mark, industrial design, all the annexes, actually you, you see that well, Properly speaking, there are issues with aspect of them that you might think a continent like Africa would probably not want to, 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 to veer into when it comes to legislating in the area of intellectual property. But unfortunately, that has been the case. Now, I would want to focus on some of the annexes to, to, to the Bangui Agreement, uh, specifically the annex on patent, and also the annex on plant variety, as I said, these are uh, uh, issues that I want to raise and to be able to show how, in a way, they do not benefit or wouldn't benefit the African country. Um, the African Union has come up with many model laws. One of them, as I rightly said, being the African uh, Union's model law for the pro uh, model legislation for the protection of the rights of local communities farmers and breeders and for the regulation of access to biological resources, not simply known as the African model law. It is not you know, a, a, a hard law, it is, it is soft, a soft law instrument. It is just guidelines for all African countries to, to, to be able to utilize when devising their own national laws concerning patent or for instance, plant breeders rights and, and, and genetic resources or biological diversity and other related issues that, that might flow from this, this kind of uh, 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 provision or, or uh, 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 guideline uh, provided by the African Union. But unfortunately, when it comes to intellectual property non-making in Africa, both the ARIPO, the African Regional Intellectual Property Organization, and UAPI seem not to follow some of these uh, guidelines coming from the African Union. What I would say is that the guidelines so far coming from the African Union are, are instruments that are actually 
beneficial that has been you know where filtered i mean it 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 they are designed and framed in such a way that it takes into account the uh, the level of development of the African continent and the needs of the continent, such that if they are properly taken into account, into account they might benefit the continent. Uh, you know, the continent is is blessed with many natural resources, and and for instance, when it comes to geographical indication, even even plant varieties. Uh, talk of traditional knowledge and traditional cultural exp expressions and what have you. These are the, 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 the intellectual property, if I may say, that probably are more useful for the continent and that the continent should be passionate about because there are more and more of them. As we all know, uh, at the moment, there is no uh, headway concerning the uh, WIPO IGC on, on, on traditional knowledge and, and traditional cultural exp expressions and also on genetic resources. But the African Union has a framework for that. And I think member states could have easily relied on that in devising similar framework for especially the two regional IP organizations. But unfortunately, that hasn't been the case. So what we see is the reverse. So for instance, when it comes to patent uh, protection, uh, that is the annex one of the Bangui agreement. We have provisions that, you know, in a way doesn't take even into account the flexibilities from the TRIPS agreement. So for instance, there are provisions in annex one that imposes more stringent conditions for the use of composing license by third parties or governments than TRIPS requires. So it demands, for instance, a, a judicial procedure in national civil courts before licensing licenses to third parties can be granted. And that for me is quite problematic because the TRIPS provision doesn't have these kind of mechanisms in place. It's mostly a decision by uh, an administrative institution like a minister for, for uh, trade and industry or a minister in charge of uh, uh, in, uh, industry or IP or whatever who might be able or help who might be able to make some of these determination. But here, the member states have agreed that before a non-voluntary license or composing license will be issued, there should be a special procedure in court where the court, the judge will have to accept or approve the issuance or give permission for the composing license to be invoked. And these are some of the issues we, we tend to complain about that. Well, a system like African should not be having these kind of rules in place because invariably these would not benefit the continent. Um, another one is the categorization of patent infringement as counterfeit and as such criminalizes it. Um, we all know that the TRIPS agreement only consider trademarks as counterfeit and obviously a, 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 a copyright for piracy. Um, patent should probably speaking not be considered as counterfeit, but interestingly, when it comes to the annex one of the Bangui agreement, patent is seen as uh, infringement, infringement of patent is counted as counterfeit, and therefore it is criminalized in a way that the offense of counterfeiting shall be punishable by imprisonment for one to three years and a fine of 5,000 to 30,000 uh, CIFA or one of the penalties alone without prejudice to civil damages. So you begin to realize that these are standards that in a way go beyond the international framework or uh, system that are in place already. And as again, I said, countries like African countries or uh, uh, nations like Africa and uh, those of us in Africa should rather be thinking of how do we incorporate the flexibilities inherent in the international IP system in a way that will benefit our economic progress and development, in a way that will benefit our technological advancement in a way that will help us to develop our traditional knowledge systems, uh, our traditional cultural expressions, and our food system that can be branded as geographical indications, our genetic resource. These are the kind of systems we should be thinking. So for instance, if it comes to the protection of plant breeders, right, or plant variety, I should be thinking we might be thinking more about uh, sea general systems or even utilizing the African model law than probably going for you know, the UPOF uh, 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 system that, that has been well criticized. But I, I, 
I will probably talk about that when I move to the next slide. Uh, the last point I wanted to make on what regarding patents is that it also protects pharmaceutical product regardless of the TRIPS Council decision, which I referred to earlier. So for instance, I know in Africa, one country that doesn't protect pharmaceutical patents, that is Rwanda. I think there's another country that has escaped me. But beyond that, most of the African countries already have strict intellectual property laws, patent laws in place that do not recognize or acknowledge that, for instance, we, there is no need to have a, a, a pharmaceutical patent protected. And obviously, it doesn't take into account uh, what even the TRIPS uh, General Council recently did for them. And that is a bit of a, a contrast because on the one hand, they raised these issues with the TRIPS Council, but on the other hand, at the national level or at the regional level, they are having completely different frameworks when it comes to intellectual property uh, norm making. Now, br a brief one on the Annex 10, which is on plant variety protection. Um, it has been criticized that it's just a replica of the U4 1991 convention, which many scholars are critical of. They say it does not encourage uh, 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 I'll acknowledge uh, the contribution of, of farmers in, in, in this whole ecosystem of, 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 of uh, 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 breeding and also even sharing uh, of seeds. And, and, and therefore, for the fact that the Bangui agreement in its revision would move on to adopt a protocol on plant variety that in a way replicates uh, uh, the, the, the U of 1991 uh, 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 convention has received a lot, a lot, a lot of criticism from, from scholars alike. Uh, for instance, the, the duration of protection is more extensive in the uh, an extent than it is with the UPOF convention. Uh, the UPOF 1991 convention has 20 years in, in the uh, 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 Bangui uh, framework, it is 25 years. So then you see that there's five more years added to what is the international standard. And I think, again, it is not for countries to, to, to be, you know, having systems of rules regarding intellectual property in place that do not benefit their citizens. At, at the end of the day, I mean, even the Western nations, some of the, and most of, some of the most advanced nations have plant variety regimes that only have grant uh, 20 years of protection. So the question is, why would you want to have 25 years of uh, 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 period of protection for a, a plant breeder who, who is able to come up with something novel and distinctive and therefore attains a, a certificate of uh, variety protection? And that feeds again into the, the debate that you know there is this external influence, political influence that comes through the back door in the form of technical assistance when it comes to implementation of treaties or even the drafting of treaties, especially in the African context. Because as you would see, WIPO and the UPOP have been contributing greatly to the development of intellectual property law in Africa, right from the foundations of their independence to date. Uh, WIPO at some point was, was managing the websites of uh, Aripo and UAPI and provided financial resource to make sure these organizations are able to function properly. As I was at Aripo, you know, I was interviewing them and asking them questions about where the staff get their training. And almost 100% of the staff are Western trained, as I said. And in training them, some of them, you know, fly to Geneva, elsewhere to Europe and elsewhere. And, and the training, for instance, do not take into account uh, uh, the, the IP system, the innovation and the creativity systems in place in Africa. And that is where the critique of, you know, socializing these guys into the Western standards and, and thinking about IP sets in. They go back and interestingly in my interview, you see that there's this huge wall of defense where they, they, they try to defend everything intellectual property, be it plant variety, be it patent or trademark, because that is how they see, that is what they understand. They do not see the other side of the equation. They do not understand even the other side of the picture. If you ask them why they have not taken, for instance, the African Union model laws or guide laws, guide, uh, laws on, that guys uh, 
pr provide some guidelines for member states to, to utilize when uh, formulating their national laws on be it patent or geographical indication, all they will say is that, well, I mean, we are part of a global community and we live in an information society, knowledge economy, and for us to be able to compete with the stronger guys, we need to have laws that are at par with them. And, and you begin to worry that, well, I mean, in as much as it's, it's a legitimate claim, we are having systems of laws that our citizens don't even practically have any knowledge of, don't even understand. Because when I was there, I also had the opportunity to interview uh, 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 stakeholders in the field, like musicians and fashion designers. And some of them didn't know anything about design laws or patent or copyright. So on the one hand, we have these laws that are in a way probably there for foreign uh, 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 right holders and not for the citizens, because at the end of the day, the reality is that you go to the ground and the citizens for which these laws are made for knows nothing about these laws. And therefore they're not benefiting from these laws in any way. Well, the next point is the right conferred by a plant variety certificate is extensive as far as it covers harvested material obtained through unauthorized use of the propagating material of the protected variety invariably, meaning that if, 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 if you have managed to you know, get some, some propagated material from a source that was unauthorized, uh, the, the, the original breeder still have control over, over uh, uh, the, the, the third uh, uh, product that has been produced based on the second uh, unauthorized use. But then again, this is quite problematic. It, it, you know, it expands the, the, the scope of protection or the rights of the breeder to the extent that it limits. It doesn't give any leeway again for farmers to, to be able to you know, uh, rely on, 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 on seeds in trying to you know, expand uh, 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 cultivation. And that again has been criticized as not probably necessary for again, a system like the OAP uh, 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 structure that we have in place. Then there are extensive provisions dealing with infringement and other unlawful acts. Again, just like the case of patent, it's, it's, it stipulates injunctions, civil damages, and criminal sanctions and seizures. And I think all these do not augur well for, for, for if we would want to devise a system that would, at the end of the day, really benefit uh, a, a continent like Africa, because uh, obviously, as I said, even the citizens themselves do not understand much about IP law, not to talk of these complications. So probably you have many of them infringing anyway. And when you begin imposing some of these sanctions, then, I mean, it, it's, in, it's certainly bad for, for, for the system because then your citizens are not in a position to, to, to even well, even regardless of the fact that they have no knowledge of intellectual property, they are being punished for infringing. And, and I think to understand that 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 it might be criticized as not good being good for again a, a continent or a, a systems like uh, those we have in Africa. Then um, lastly, I might want to say that if you look at the current framework in Africa regarding plant variety, we have. Outside the OAP framework, where all the member states, 17 member states of OAP are automatic uh, members of the UPOP because they have the uh, Annex uh, 10, which kind of uh, uh, binds them necessarily to be members of UPOP, we have countries like Egypt, Ethiopia, Kenya, Morocco, Rwanda, South Africa, Tanzania, Tunisia, Zambia, Zimbabwe, all have national uh, plant variety laws and offices in place. Now, recently, Ghana also passed a plant variety law. It has been approved, it has received presidential assent. So it's, I probably think it will soon be gazetted and will be operational. As of February this year, uh, Ghana, Nigeria, Mauritius, and Zimbabwe are among the list of countries that have initiated procedures for acceding to the UPOF Convention. And lastly, I would like to say that uh, the Southern African uh, Development Community has its ninth member, Botswana, signing its plant variety protocol because that, that uh, uh, REC has also designed 
uh, a plant variety regime. As of now, South Africa is a member of UPO, but the 1978, they, they, they subscribed to the 1978 UPO convention and nine, not the 1991. If this, this uh, protocol, the, 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 the SADC uh, uh, plant variety protocol requires just 10 members to ratify and then it will come into force. So once the next member ratifies it, a country like South Africa, South Africa will be forced to now utilize the UPOF 1991 convention. And, and, and it remains as scholars are debating about the implications of some of these systems for the continent. So I hope that I've been able to briefly uh, show the, the scheme of things in the continent and why probably some of these rules are not as good as they should be because at the end of the day, um, if you go to the ground as a day, there's a lot happening in terms of no understanding of intellectual property. And we have a system there that doesn't actually fit or isn't really, really what is probably the continent uh, needs. So yes, briefly, this is what I would say if it was brief at all uh, about uh, uh, my research and the contribution I made to Henning's book. So on that note, thank you. And I'll be happy to answer any question and probably raise any other issue that I'm missing presenting whilst uh, talking. Thank you very much. OK, excellent. So, thank you so much, um, Daniel. That was uh, a very comprehensive talk, I think, uh, nicely outlining the broader twill concept. This, uh, I particularly like this idea uh, which you presented about uh, technical assistance as this vector for systemically integrating uh, African countries into the broader international IP system, some sort of, as you, I think, framed it as a managerial tool to socialize African countries into a particular type of thinking and uh, application of, of, of IP norms. Um, I certainly would have uh, a few questions now. Uh, there may, however, be, of course, someone uh, from the audience. So far, I don't think there is any particular questions being posed in the Q&A. Mm -hmm. So while we encourage uh, the audience to do that, let me maybe just go ahead and ask one or two questions mm -hmm. to you. Um, so I was um, quite intrigued, uh, and I've heard about this before, and I've always wondered how it actually works. Um, the model you described with regard to uh, WAPI, which seems to be based on having uniform rules, which seem to be directly applicable, not really requiring further domestic implementation. And that's, of course, quite a, um, if you think about it in the international IP context, normally we're talking even with regard to free trade agreement and their comprehensive and detailed rules, we're talking about provisions which require domestic implementation. And, and often the rules themselves are only written in a way that they directly address states mm -hmm. rather than uh, even being potentially applicable as a framework between private parties where, where IP law operates on the ground. So I just wonder, do you know a little bit more how, how the Bangui agreement and these other agreements in ORP actually operate on the ground? I mean. I, I can't imagine there being sort of regional institutions which actually enforce these rules. So it's domestic courts, I suppose, and domestic enforcement agencies, uh, which, which are sort of tasked with, with applying these rules. Do you know a little bit more on, on how that actually works? Thank you for your question. Um, I think in my visit to Aripo, the same issue come, came up when I was asking a, a colleague who actually come from Cameroon about how it operates. And she actually told me that, for instance, if I'm not wrong, if I got her right, she intimated that, for instance, if there is an infringement, for instance, in Cameroon, the decision of a national court would automatically apply in all the other member states. And I, and I found that to, to be a bit bizarre, but she, she was quite upfront and confident about it. And she was defending the, the case that so I think to understand the question you are asking is, is something I've also been thinking about as to how that can be, that 
these norms are agreed at the ORP level, at the regional level, and automatically, it has 17 member states, by the way, mm -hmm. and it automatically applies on all these member states. Uh, yes, it is an important question, but um, I am yet to actually visit ORP. I hope to do that next year, but I think so far as I, I proved, uh, there is an institutional framework at uh, the ORP level, which I think somehow, um, I don't know how it happens, but somehow has direct uh, 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 coordination with the various national uh, 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 governing or uh, 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 governing bodies for regarding intellectual property, be it the intellectual property office or for the patent office or the copyright office or whatever ministry that manage. I, I probably suppose there is some kind of uh, relation going on where maybe these uh, 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 member states or whatever are able to, in a way, follow whatever decision that, that comes from uh, 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 URP. Um, as again, as I said, that is something that I'm yet to figure out and probably the best approach would be to visit them and to, and to question them because again, one of the tricky, tricky things is, is that, you know, the, 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 the URP regime is mostly in, in French and you need to be there in order to understand much of the, the treaty, uh, the treaties are in English, by the way, but to be able to understand the day-to-day -day operation and function of, of the system. So yes, thank you for that question. That's something I've also been wondering about because obviously I understand the ARIPO system, but when it comes to the ORP system, it's something that I'm also grappling with as to how it effectively operates in, in that regard, yeah. Yeah, I mean, just to just to follow up on that, because I think it has the uh, quite important implications for um, how effectively on the ground IP protection is exercised and and practiced, right? I mean, mm -hmm. if, if you think about it, uh, even these very precise rules and free trade agreements and even the, the, the rules and trips and all these other international IP commitments, because they are state to state commitments that in my view effectively leaves quite still some policy space for actually turning them into operational rules on the ground where the notion of territoriality and domestic IP rights being sort of essentially territorial rights mm -hmm. secures some degree of, you know, um, policy space flexibility to yeah. design the system which works for local actors or potentially at least right so and and if that is of course taken away if you have number one direct effect and perhaps even as you describe it potentially um, well uniform recognition or uh, effect and enforcement of a judgment given in one of the member states and in, in other member states which I think would raise lots of interesting private international law questions. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, what you're describing seems to be a system which goes beyond even the, the, the current degree of harmonization in the European Union, where if you look at it uh, with the uh, trademark regulation and the say design right regulation, plant variety right regulation, you have uniform rights, uh, again, applicable across the union but their enforcement yeah. by and large is still subject to national courts, national entities, um, domestic pra practice of the domestic patent bars or whatever IP sort of um, uh, barristers, solicitors involved. Yeah. And I think that that last step, right, usually I think ensures some degree of local tailoring yeah. to some extent yeah. in, in practice. But if that's missing, I think there's a key, there's a key question of, um, you know, how far this sort of regional level can directly affect the, the, the level of protection on the ground. And I think that would be a very interesting piece of research. Um, so, yeah. so I look forward yeah. for, your, yeah. For, yeah. For, for your research yeah. on in, yeah. this yeah. in the future. Yes, certainly. I, I fully agree with you, Tenen. I, I think that is something I'm equally interested in. in in trying to feel, it might be that that is not the case once you get there, but sitting from here, it's, it's a bit not clear now how, you know, there should be one uh, framework at the regional level that is, as you said, rightly said, applicable to all the 17 member states. Well, to understand, I think, you know, France has been of a huge influence here. Um, I think when it comes to the Francophone countries, 
as compared to the Anglophone. That is where the difference lies. You know, the Francophone countries tend to be kind of uniform, even when it comes to currency, compared to the Anglophone. So I think that system of uniform uh, or uniformization, we may use that term, is quite common when it comes to the Anglo uh, 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 Francophone side. And, and therefore, I think the judicial systems in place are almost similar because it follows after the, the French uh, uh, system. And in a way, my thinking is that that probably might be the reason why the, at, the, at the OIP level, there has been that, that kind of uniform standards because they think it might readily or easily be, be, be received at the national level because already the systems in place are so different from country country that is my guess but because because these issues have come up we've been debating why things are so different when it comes to the anglophone countries uh, compared to the francophone because it seems things are quite smooth running there compared to 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 Aripo where everything is double tiered and double layered so then you have to yeah uh, have different judgments from different courts from different member states and and countries decide when to um, uh, ratify or even sign uh, protocols and when not to. And as at the moment, there are many protocols that are struggling to, 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 to get the footing because member states of Aripo are refusing to, to sign them or adhere to them. So yeah, I'm, I'm happy that you've raised these things. There are, this is something that I'll take probably next year when I'm able to visit Cameroon and the OIP. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, Daniel. I think we're almost out of time, but I just wanted to quickly, because I don't see any other sort of posts in the chat. I wanted to quickly ask one further question. You you began or sort of at the early stages of the talk, you referenced uh, Hong Su's, you know, um, quote, uh, the wind blowing from the West. Mm -hmm. Now, I just wonder, I mean, of course, there's a lot of talk uh, with regard to China's influence in Africa, uh, and in particular, probably more in relation to, to infrastructure and investment mm -hmm. and, and market access. Is there any significant influence of China with regard to intellectual property protection in Africa? Or is that truly still mainly a Western project? I think when it comes to intellectual property standards and its development or rules, it's a purely Western uh, concept and influence. You know, the Chinese has been influenced in the continent. It's a problem for many of the citizens, but then they, their strategy, they have a completely different strategy. You know, they are not interested in the rule of law once they are on the continent. They are not interested in human rights. They are not interested in the environment. What they are interested in their, is their investments mm. and also access to, obviously, the resources. I think fundamentally, um, I'm being straightforward, but if you look at the Chinese policy in Africa, and that is basically it. Their interest in resources and also what they are there to, to get and not much about what, how you rule yourself and whether not rule yourself and whether you have the right intellectual property norms in place or not. So, so far I've not seen or heard them uh, talking or doing anything regarding mm -hmm. the institution of intellectual property norms. I think when it comes to the rule of law, it's mostly a European or Western standard that is sometimes a requirement for these uh, uh, providence or provision of aid to, to the countries of Africa. Yeah. Yeah. Now, that, it might, of course, maybe in well, one or two decades or however long it takes for China to perhaps make further leaps towards technological advances mm -hmm. and, and going beyond uh, in terms of AI and lots of other new technologies beyond what uh, maybe is on offer uh, in terms of R&D and developments in the West. At that time, perhaps China will, uh, uh, if continuing ha ha to have a strong interest in Africa, find it's quite useful to have the Western countries having kind of paved the way in ensuring mm -hmm. that sufficient mm -hmm. uh, treaty standards yeah. are in the books in Africa in order yeah. for Chinese entities to, yeah. to rely on those. Um, uh, but that's, of course, uh, quite speculative, but it might well be something where um, um, China is uh, in, in a good position simply to leave that job for, 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 for the Europeans yeah. and Americans yes. to do, uh, because these provisions, I would assume, apply to right holders from all over oh, exactly. the world, and they, the because of national treatment, would yeah. be have 
to be be available for Chinese companies as much as they are available to European and American yeah. and other yeah. uh, entities. Yeah. That's that's uh, yeah. Um, well, uh, Daniel, thank you so much. I think we we have to leave it here. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, thanks a lot for for your paper and the discussion. And I look forward to catch up at uh, whatever time. And mm -hmm. thanks to our audience. And uh, uh, look forward to see you at the next CIPL seminar. And with that, I say goodbye to everyone and take care. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Bye bye. Take care.